Well, next week we're going to be getting back into Isaiah. We'll continue our series there in Isaiah 29. And we'll go all the way to about the middle point of the book. But before we dive back in and spend a significant number of weeks there, I wanted to take one more week in excursus, if you would, just to consider Jesus' teaching on the two greatest commandments. And the reason that I find myself led to this passage and wanting to preach it to you this morning is I think with all of the cries of social justice and very real injustices in the world there has become not only in the world itself but especially among many evangelical churches a confusion about the nature of the greatest commandment and of the relationship between love for God and love for neighbor To put it succinctly and perhaps too negatively, but yet truthfully, loving your neighbor is not the first and greatest command. And yet if you follow the news or you follow perhaps even the preaching of some of the more popular preachers today, you might walk away thinking that love for neighbor is in fact the first and the greatest command. And I want to try to persuade you this morning that if we think that way, that our love for neighbor will not turn out ultimately to be love as God defines love, but will turn out to be idolatry. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 22. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn with me there. Matthew chapter 22. You can follow along in your phones or tablets or whatever you brought with you. Matthew 22, beginning in verse 34 through verse 40. If you're here with us and you are not used to handling a Bible, Matthew is one of the 66 books of the Bible. It's the first book of the New Testament. You'll find it about three quarters of the way through your Bible. And when you open it up, you'll notice that there's really big numbers and there's really small numbers. Those big numbers are the chapters and the small numbers are the verses. We're going to be in that first book of the New Testament, the book of Matthew. You can look at your, new, you can look at your table of contents. Nobody is going to look down on you. You're free to cheat. We'll be in chapter 22. That's the big number 22, beginning in verse 34. Hear now the word of the Lord. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he, that is Jesus, said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. We see two groups here in verse 34. We see the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These are different groups of religious leaders, and they were typically opposed to one another. But as the old saying goes, an enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so in this section of Matthew, the Pharisees and the Sadducees have become friends over a common enemy, and that enemy is Jesus. And they, over the course of Matthew 22, are taking turns, challenging Jesus with a series of questions. And here in verse 34 and 35, we see the fifth of five questions posed to Jesus as an act of challenge. And all of these are ultimately with the hopes, as we see at the end of verse 35, or rather verse 15, that they might entangle him in his words. His words up to this point seemed so wonderful, too wonderful. His words were such that they were unimpeachable. Unless their own authority be undermined and their own people be swept away from them by this rogue rabbi, they seek to entangle him in his own words, to disqualify him in his ministry. 
But here in verse 34, we notice that the Sadducees were silenced by Jesus after challenging him on the resurrection. You can see that in the paragraph before. And the result wasn't much unlike the Pharisees' early attempt to challenge him on paying taxes to Caesar. One by one, like bowling pins or perhaps like dominoes, Christ is knocking down the opposition. And so in verse 35, we see that the Pharisees choose the smartest guy in the room. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question. Now this lawyer, in this context, isn't what we might think about when we think about a lawyer. He's not just a a sharp legal mind, but he's a brilliant theological mind. This is, in a sense, the closer. It's the ninth inning, and they're looking to close the deal on Jesus. And this is the one that's going to do the job. And so they send him in in verse 35 and 36 with one final challenge. But notice again their motivations at the end of verse 35. Their intent is to test him. This isn't a sincere question. No, they're trying to ensnare the Savior. They're trying to gather him in through their net, if you will. And so in verse 36, the net is cast. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment or the great commandment in the law? Now, this lawyer seems to be asking a question that gets to the main thing about the main thing. He's asking, what's the thing that God has asked of us that is greater than any other thing that God has asked of us? Now, this is really a vague question. He was trying to get Jesus to lose the forest through the trees by getting Jesus to pick one tree over another. And so you see the trap, don't you? If they can get Jesus to pick one of God's laws over another, then they can get Jesus stuck in the weeds. Perhaps even getting Jesus to get God pitted against himself. But notice in verse 37 that Jesus doesn't even blink. He doesn't even need to take a minute to think. He doesn't need to phone a friend and he doesn't need a lifeline. He immediately comes to what he'd been teaching the people all along. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. It's interesting. Here Jesus doesn't quote from any of the Ten Commandments. Nor does he quote from any part of Israel's ceremonial law or civil law. No, he quotes here from Deuteronomy 6.5. And what's significant is that this command is attached to and immediately following what's called the great Shema. Keep your finger there in Matthew 22. And I want you to turn with me. The only time we're going to turn this morning, but I want you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy is the second giving of the law. It's the preparation for the people of Israel to enter into the land and the conditions that God has placed on them so that they might live a blessed life in the land as his people. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4, Moses says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he follows up this glorious theological statement of who God is with the only appropriate response Then what is the only appropriate response to a God as glorious as the one that we see in verse 4? Well, Moses tells them in verse 5, it is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and with all of your might. And then in verses 6 through 9, as you scan through that, you'll notice that the commands to Israel in light of this chief command is to, in verse 6, write it on their hearts. In verse 7, to teach it to their children. In verse 8, to put it on their own bodies. And even in verse 9, to put it on their homes. And so when Jesus is teaching this back in Matthew 22, if you were a young Jew, even when you were knee high, you would have understood both the great Shema and this commandment. And we're meant to see in these handful of verses in Deuteronomy 6, the weightiness of this command. You're to never forget it. You're to tattoo it on everything. You're to give it to your children. This is to be known from generation to generation. So Jesus has answered the lawyer's question by saying that this command, Deuteronomy 6.5, is the preeminent command. 
Go back to Matthew 22. Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind. Verse 38, this, he says, is the great and first commandment. Now, when Jesus says that this is the first command, he doesn't mean that it was the first command that was ever given. The command is first because the command is preeminent. It is above all other commands, and therefore it is the greatest command. It's the first command because it's the greatest and it's the greatest command because it's first. This is what all the other laws are pointing to. All that God has ever commanded is designed to work in us a greater love for him. To reverence him. To worship him and to enjoy him with every, as one New Testament scholar noted, every globule of our being. Every ounce of our being. Our whole selves all of our hearts, all of our soul, and all of our mind. But now by the end of verse 38, Jesus has answered the lawyer's question. It has not gone unanswered. Jesus could stop right there and yet he continues to go. He gives a freebie, a little additional lesson just to close the case. And this is what he says. But a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, he says in verse 40, depend all the law and all the prophets. Notice in verse 39 that these commandments, the command that he says in Deuteronomy 6 in verse 37, and this command that he quotes elsewhere from the book of Leviticus, that they're alike in two ways. Notice first of all that both of these commands make love primary. That at the heart of God's law is love. Love for God and love for fellow human beings. But I want you to notice, secondly, that they're alike in their intensity. We notice here that we are to love God with our whole selves and we are to love others as we love ourselves. And of course, the answer is, if we're really honest, what part of ourselves do we not ultimately seek to love? The answer is we love all of ourselves, or at least we try to. That's the kind of love that we're to have for neighbors, an all-encompassing love. Insofar as we would neglect no aspect of love for ourselves, perhaps even in our selfishness, then we should neglect no aspect of love for our fellow human beings. That's the point. They're alike not only in emphasizing love, but they're alike in their intensity. And then Jesus lands the plane in verse 40. On these two commandments, he says, depend all of the law and all of the prophets. In other words, all of the Old Testament hangs on these two commandments. They're like hooks hanging from God's throne and all other commandments are hanging from these two hooks. And that if you lose one of these hooks, you lose everything hooked to it. In fact, one might go so far as to say that the one hook is hooked to the other one. That the hook of love for neighbor is hooked to the hook of love for God such that if you pull the hook of love for God, you lose everything. That's exactly the point that's being made here. I need someone to kill a rabbit. Ryan Adams, where are you? So if you lose one of these hooks, you lose everything hooked to it. Quite simply, if we fail brothers and sisters, you got to get this. If we fail to love God like this and to love our fellow human beings, including our enemies, as Jesus teaches in Mark, Matthew chapter 5, even including our enemies like this, then the implication is that you and I are guilty of breaking all of God's law. Put another way, if love for God is the first and greatest command, then any failure on our part to love God in this way stems from our loving something equal to or more than God. And to love anything as much as God or to love anything more than God is idolatry. In other words, if our love for something flows from any source or motivation other than the greater, chief, and preeminent 
love for God, that thing has become an idol and our love of that thing is an idolatrous love. It is an unfaithful love. It is a treasonous love against the one who is our king and creator. So an idol is anything that we love and serve that you and I think that we can't live without. And to the extent that we cannot live without that thing, oh, to that extent, well, then it prevents us from loving God with all of ourselves. And so I wonder, brothers and sisters, or friend, if you're a guest with us, what might be the idols in your life? What might be those things that you would love as much as God, if perhaps more than God? What are those things in your life that if you were to not gain it, or if you were to lose it, life would not be worth living? Might it be a relationship? That I must have him or I must have her. I can't live without them. This relationship is what completes me. It, it's, what, it's what makes me who I am to the degree that if I were to gain that relationship, oh, I would finally be happy. Or if I were to lose that relationship, well, then I wouldn't even know who I am anymore. Might it be a group of friends? Might it be the prospect of a future spouse? Or what about your current spouse, your husband or your wife? What about your children? Or even the prospect of children? I think if we're really honest with what Jesus is teaching here, lots of ways that we could apply this, but perhaps to bring it home to our own church in our own context, we can't really avoid the uncomfortable truth that disobedience to this command more often than not looks like taking the good things in our life, the really good things in our life, and raising them to the level of ultimate things in our life, which is always idolatry and perhaps the chief thing that we should evaluate, that we should get downwind to, is the uncomfortable truth that one of the acceptable idolatries among evangelical Christians is the idolatry of family. Parents who neglect the Lord's Day and go missing from church for entire seasons because of Billy's soccer league or Sally's promising dance career. Committed Christians who never dare invite a college student or a single mother with her kids over for Thanksgiving or Christmas because after all, the holidays are for family. Churches that imply or perhaps even explicitly communicate that marriage is somehow a necessary step to spiritual maturity. That there's varsity and there's junior varsity in the church. Those who are married and are really being sanctified and those who are stuck in their singleness and thus in their sanctification. Or what about Christian parents who will jettison the word of God and their theology of marriage or their convictions about church discipline once their children whom they love come out of the closet or embrace other kinds of unrepentant sin? Certainly God's word can't mean what I've always thought it meant then. Perhaps their love for child becomes greater than love for God. And so I think as evangelicals, especially in our own context, we need to be confronted that the idolatry of family can be a very real problem, that the very best things in our life can be turned into ultimate things and thus become idolatry. And it can be so either from the church that ignores singles and gears everything toward married couples with children, or from the individual whose practical commitments underscore the unfortunate reality that blood is thicker than theology. In all these ways and more, brothers and sisters, are we not tempted to make our love of family greater than our love for God and others? So I ask again, what are the idols in your life? What are those really good things that you've raised to the level of ultimate things in your life? And if it's not people, if it's not relationship, might they be things? That I must have this car or that house or those kinds of clothes or this kind of job with this kind of income or I have nothing and I am nothing. 
Therefore, I don't have time to worship every single Sunday. I don't have time to study my Bible. I don't have time to pray. I don't even have time to play with my kids. We look at child sacrifice often as an antiquated practice of an old religious world, but the reality is is that we are still to this day sacrificing our own children for the idol of self. Either for the sake of our own career, our own autonomy. Is this not ultimately the idolatry that undergirds the industry of abortion? Or perhaps... It's things not like a job or clothes or cars or houses. Perhaps it's things like our culture. The way that we think about ourselves first. That this is what it means to be American. Or this is what it means to be white or black or Hispanic. And if anything in God's word rubs against the way that I want to see myself or against the community in which I find greatest solidarity, then I'm going to go with my culture and I'm not going to go with God. To that extent, we love our culture more than we love God. Brothers and sisters, we need to be regularly evaluating ourselves, especially as we enter into this political season. Friends, I want to suggest that this passage teaches that we can even make loving our neighbor into an idol. I noted earlier how these two commands, love for God and love for neighbor, are alike. And they are alike, as we just noticed. They're alike in the way that they emphasize love, and they're alike in their intensity. But when Jesus says the second one is like the first... He does not mean that the second one is equal to the first. When the lawyer asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was, Jesus responded that the first and the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God. Then having sufficiently answered the lawyer's question, Jesus mentions a different commandment. In verse 39, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This commandment is not only distinct from the first, but it is ultimately dependent upon the first. They are two different commandments. And two different commandments cannot both be the greatest commandment and the first commandment, lest Jesus be self-contradictory. This commandment, Jesus says, is a second commandment. Not to be confused or conflated with the first and the greatest commandment. Now some of you might be saying, come on Jeff, aren't aren't you kind of splitting hairs a little bit here? Not at all. Let me give you three reasons why it's important for us to recognize that love for God is the first and greatest commandment. First, because Jesus says so. We cannot allow our familiarity with these commands to cause us to become blind and deaf to what Jesus clearly says. Second, Love for God is the commandment upon which all other commandments hang, including the command for neighbor love. Everything else is idolatry. That the first and the greatest command must precede and it must motivate obedience to all other commands. Put simply, we must love God more than we love our neighbor if we are to love our neighbor as God commands. That is not political conservatism. That isn't Trumpism. That is Jesus. This is why John Calvin commented on this passage. He, speaking of Jesus, assigns the second place to mutual kindness among men for the worship of God is first in order. The commandment to love our neighbors, he tells us, is like the first because it depends upon it. For since every man is devoted to himself, there will never be true charity toward neighbors unless where the love of God reigns. For it is a mercenary love which the children of the world entertain for each other because every one of them has regard to his own advantage. Meaning that 
love for neighbor apart from love for God is always seasoned with and intermixed with and motivated by love for myself. I want to look a certain way in the public eye. I want to gain a certain political office. I want to get a certain kind of promotion. I want to be thought of in a certain way by my friends or peers. I don't want to be thought of by those kinds of people like that. That's what he's saying. But he says, on the other hand, it is impossible for the love of God to reign without producing brotherly kindness among men. You say, okay, Jeff, so now, is what you're saying then that we shouldn't love neighbor then? We should just be concerned primarily with our quiet times and our prayer lives and coming to church. Is that what we need to be primarily concerned with? No, we need to outright reject that kind of pietism. That leads to a disobedience that refuses to love neighbor that I think disqualifies our witness and may very well prove that we're not in fact Christians. What I'm saying as Jesus is saying here, and we need to recognize that the sin of leaving off the second commandment and supposed obedience to the first commandment is a problem. You cannot love God without ultimately loving your neighbor. Jesus is plain about that. We see this throughout the whole Bible. Elsewhere, the apostle John writes that if, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. You don't really love God, he's saying. James, the half-brother of Jesus, makes it a little bit more practical for us. He says, those who use their tongues to bless our Lord and Father who show up to church and sing great songs and read their Bible and come do prayers of praise and confession, and yet with those very si same tongues, curse people made in the likeness of God is a contradiction of the very thing to which we have been called. In fact, he goes so far, James does, in saying that it is to violate all of the law. So what I'm not saying is that love for God excludes love for neighbor. But here's what I am saying. The dividing line between Christians and atheists, between Christians and any other world religion, between Christians and theological liberals who have rejected the Bible as supernaturally inspired by God, between Christians and today's secular champions of the social justice movement is that they take the second commandment of neighbor love to be the first commandment. And in so doing, what they do is they redefine love outside of God's law. And in doing so, they lose motivation for obedience and they fail to love God and neighbor who is created in God's image. Brothers and sisters, herein lies the fatal flaw of the social justice movement. And I think of many evangelical pastors and Christians who are falling into it. That when we assume the gospel and demote love for God in order to elevate love of neighbor to equal with love or perhaps even above love for God, then we are guilty of idolatry and we lose love for neighbor. We lose the very thing we aim to champion. When love for neighbor becomes the first and greatest command, you no longer need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the first and greatest goal of the gospel is not to create passionate lovers of men, but born again worshipers of God. The reason that the preaching of the gospel is the mission of the church and not social justice is because the first and greatest command is to love God, not to love your neighbor. And this ultimately leads me to my final point then. How in the world then can this commandment be fulfilled? Brothers and sisters, if you know your heart the way that I know my own heart, then you know that these two commands are impossible to fulfill. No amount of guilting, no amount of chanting from churches and preachers and social justicians in our culture telling you why you're a bad Christian for not doing all these various things in these exact ways for everyone everywhere to see you doing them. That cannot motivate you for the kind of love for God that Jesus is prescribing here. That has to be done supernaturally by the grace of God through the 
Holy Spirit, accompanying the proclamation of the gospel, changing, transforming, converting, and regenerating us, bringing from spiritual death to spiritual life. No amount of cultural guilt can do that. So as we established any failure on our part to obey these two commands, beginning with the first and greatest command to love God, with our whole selves is to break all of God's law, including loving your neighbor. And that is sin. And the Bible says that all of us, every one of us deserve just condemnation for this sin. How are you doing when it comes to loving the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul and all of your strength every minute of every day of every week of every month of your life and having every ounce of love for neighbor be motivated without any mixture of selfishness or self-interest by the unadulterated, uncompromised love for God. How you doing? How then can any any of us, even the best among us, even those of us who are the greatest in our advocacy for the poor and for injustice in the world, how can any one of us ultimately be rescued from God's judgment if that's true? Because the answer is, is if we love neighbor at the expense of love for God, then we will love our neighbor all the way to hell. How do we avoid that? And the answer is that God has to somehow fulfill this law for us. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus fulfills both of these commands in Matthew 22. The greatest command to love the Lord as God with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength and as a consequence to love his neighbor as himself perfectly every minute of every day of every week of every month of his life for as long as he was on this earth in his incarnation. That he fulfilled them perfectly. And he did it in two ways. First, he did it through his active obedience to God's law. And second, he did it through his passive obedience to to God's law. What do I mean by those? Let me explain. Christ actively obeyed God's law in that he obeyed positively all of the positive commands that God has given in his law and he has refused in all of his life negatively all that God condemns in his law. That he didn't just avoid sinning, he positively obeyed the law in every jot and every tittle as God had prescribed it perfectly. He came to fulfill righteousness. But he didn't just fulfill the law in his active obedience. He also fulfilled it in his passive obedience. What I mean by that is not that Christ was passive and that somebody else was doing it to him against his will. What I mean that Christ fulfilled it through his passive obedience is that he willingly took upon himself the penalty of the law that you and I deserve. That which he did not deserve. Not as one who had no other choice. Not as one who did so unwillingly. But one who did so willingly. As the father had promised to give him a people if he did. That he did so willingly because of his elect. He did so willingly because of all of those who would turn and trust in him. He did so willingly because you and I, if we are in Christ, are his inheritance and his love has been laid on us from before the foundation of the world. And it is that very love that has driven the son to willingly, not passively as if he's a, if he's a victim of circumstance, willingly in covenant with the father to lay down his life for you because he loves you. Brothers and sisters, in his death on the cross, he not only fulfilled the righteousness of the law in his obedience, but he also fulfilled the justice of the law in God's punishment against lawbreakers. And that is why the Bible says that Christ became a curse for us. 
Elsewhere, the Bible teaches that for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. In other words, God made him something other than what he was on the cross so that he might make you and I something other than what we are by our very natures. That is righteous before the holy, holy, holy God and creator of the universe. The law, as we see in Matthew 22, requires perfect love. And you and I have loved him perfectly, if at all. So in reality, when people ask or accuse us of being bad Christians, the reality is there is no such thing as a good Christian if we take Matthew 22 seriously. There are only Christians who are desperately in need of grace and have thrown themselves by God's grace upon his mercy in Christ. But the good news for every sinner, for you and for me, is that all of the perfect love that the law requires, Christ provides. There has never been one who has loved the Father more that Christ in love, both for his Father and for us, gave himself to satisfy the Father for us. And in that one great act of vicarious substitution of, of laying down his life in our place, he fulfilled once and for all and gave the world a, a model, a, a picture of what perfect love for God and for neighbor looks like, including his enemies. For while we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. There has never been one who has loved the Father more and that for all who repent and believe in Christ, brothers and sisters, listen to me. The Father does not love you more or less because of your loveliness, and the Father does not love you more or less because of your lovingness. The Father loves you because he loves Christ, and you are in Christ. And because you are in Christ, the Father loves you with no less love than he has for his very own son. That is good news for sinners. Brothers and sisters, no amount of neighbor love, no amount of concern for social justice, no amount of advocacy, as good as it may be, and I hope all of us would labor for the good of our neighbors, no amount of neighbor love can make the Father loves you more than he already loves you in Christ. It doesn't change his opinion to you one whit because of what Christ has done. What that means is that that indestructible, infinite, bottomless, inexhaustible love that the Father has for us in Christ now becomes the inexhaustible. Your tank is never empty because you have been filled in Christ. That love now becomes the fuel for why we love our fellow human beings, for why we love the fellow members of this church, for why we love even our enemies, because God has loved us so much in Christ. Brother and sister, God loves you in and through Christ alone. And as we are perfected in Christ through the Holy Spirit, then our love for the Father becomes or comes from the love that Christ has for his Father. And brothers and sisters, the more that we learn to trust in Christ, the more his love for the Father becomes our love for the Father. And then our love for the Father turns into loving others like the Father. And so you see, don't you? As I said from the very beginning, the main point of our passage, there is no way to avoid these commands. Loving God and loving your neighbor apart from faith in Christ. And there is no faith to be had in Christ apart from first the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The great goal of the gospel is love for God. The great implication 
of our love for God through the gospel is love for neighbor. May we never get those things backwards.